All righty. Um, thanks so much for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for giving up a bit of their evening to um, to come along tonight. It's really, really great to have the opportunity to uh, to share what sounds like a bit of an, uh, an out there kind of conversation. Can machine learning predict where my cat is now? Now, I don't know where you're joining from, but I'm joining from Sydney. It's 6 p.m. here, it's Thursday evening, and it's raining. And I wanted to answer a simple question. Can I actually use a machine learning model to predict where my cat is sleeping now? I wanted to spend just 20 minutes of your time sharing this story about how I used a Bluetooth tracker, some open source machine learning libraries to predict where my cat would be sleeping in the next hour. Hi, my name's Simon, Simon Aubrey. I'm a principal data engineer and I work at ThoughtWorks and I'm based out of Sydney, Australia. I work as a consultant. I get to the opportunity to build some pretty amazing data-driven products, work with platforms and help really help uh, build some culture to unlock really some amazing insights based on data. So my day job is typically combining machine learning, streaming platforms and modern data engineering practices. Now, I can't always share what uh, cool activities we work with our clients, but today I wanted to share a local story just to give you a bit of an inspiration about how some of this technology can come together. So that's enough about me. I wanted to introduce my cat. This is Snowy. She's our four-year-old, somewhat ironically named cat. So I wanted to use some inexpensive hardware and a cat who is a bit ambivalent when it comes to data privacy and see if I could actually train a machine learning model to work out where Snowy the cat was going to be during her day. Now, before I move on to the project itself, I just wanted to do just a really baseline machine learning 101 primer, just so we're all on exactly the same baseline so we can actually understand what's going on here. So machine learning comes in various forms. You've got areas such as predicting values and characteristics. You've got recommendation engines. You've got natural language processing, and you've got things that sort of process images. So these are the sort of the categories of machine learning and some of the some of the uh, kind of scenarios that you might uh, use machine learning in. But in short, let's think about a really, really simple case. So generally, we have data and we want that data to inform an outcome, essentially answer a question. So consider a really, really elementary thing. Can we detect fraud based on some transactional information. Now, how would you go about solving that? If I'm a human here, I might think to myself, I can look at some transactional information, kind of make some insights and work out if fraud has occurred, sort of yes or no. So the most common way of doing that or a historic way of doing that was to write some code, but that's a bit sort of slow and it's a bit sort of cumbersome. So instead of writing code and those rules in code, can we actually come up with a faster way of getting those insights? How do we determine if there's fraud if we're not going to be writing code? So instead of rules-based code, we can describe a method that is using machine learning to get these outcomes. So if we've got a bunch of data like this, transactions, some historic information about whether those transactions were fraudulent or not, you can actually build up a bit of a wind, a bit of an idea about what transactional characteristics are associated with fraud. And this is sort of the essence of machine learning. You take a whole bunch of historic information, you give it to a rules engine, and you see if you can generate some insights. You train a model, you build up a level of inference, and you can take some past data and a machine learning model and make inferences about data that you've never seen before. So you train a model and then you get a bit of a, a probability of whether fraud has occurred. So you're thinking to yourself, well, that's interesting, but how does that help me with cats? What does that mean to me? So we can take this exact same thinking and apply it when we actually want to do something interesting like determine where a cat is. So instead of taking transactional information from a banking system, we can actually take some historic observations about where a cat has been. For example, if I observe that at 9 a.m. on a cold morning, my cat sleeps in the study, I might be able to use this historic information to train a model. 
And with that trained model, I can make inferences around data that I haven't seen. For example, I might be able to guess at that eight o'clock in the morning on a cold morning, there's a reasonable probability that my cat would also be in the study. So in short, we can take historic information, use it to train a model, and build up an inference model to predict where a cat's going to be in the future. Excellent. So that gives you a bit of an idea about the, the techniques. So let's talk about the flow. How do we actually break down machine learning? And this is typically broken into seven steps, defining a problem, obtaining some data, working with that data, building a model, testing the viability of that model, and then getting into a bit of a loop. And this is typically the process for all machine learning problems. So what's our first problem here? We actually want to take data and predict where a cat is going to be sleeping. Now, what data are we going to be needing here? Now, I can make a bit of a, a judgment call here that my cat's going to be influenced by things like temperature, time of day, day of the week, possibly whether it's raining or not. So this data would be really great to capture historically and used in our model to predict her location going forwards. It's the data we're going to need and the outcome that we actually want to predict. But how do you go about collecting a bunch of historic information? What's the process? Now, this was the first challenge I had. Um, now, Snowy is not particularly good at data entry, so I needed to come up with an automated way of actually working out where she's been historically. So how do you actually obtain that data to initially seed up a model? Well, my answer is to get some cool hardware. How do you actually cat initially track a cat at a room level around a house? I actually used um, this Bluetooth beacon. It's called a tile, and it actually hangs on her collar. And it just sits there, is a very lightweight device, and actually just transmits a Bluetooth low energy signal. Around the house, I'm using a whole bunch of stationary sensors. These are little boards, they're called ESP32s. They're about five or $6. And these are placed around the house in fixed location. I can use the combination of the Bluetooth uh, transmitter on her collar and the stationary receivers around the house to make a level of approximation on the location of Snowy at any time. In short, the stronger the signal, the more likely the cat is in that location. But I also want to capture some other data. I want to capture things like temperature and humidity. And I want to have that data around the house, in the house, and outside the house. So I used a number of uh, Zigbee-based devices just to capture uh, the environmental conditions. So in short, I'm capturing location and I'm catch capturing environmental conditions to actually start building up that picture of where Snowy's been. And then I needed a data collection platform. So I chose to use a Python-based open source platform called Home Assistant. And this was actually a really, really flexible and well-regarded well uh, community project, which was easily extensible to actually start capturing all of the location information, the strength of the radio transmissions, and those environmental conditions such as humidity and temperature, and started amassing all of that information in the one place. So that's how you capture the data. But now we've got a bit more of a task of actually being able to streamline it and get, that get the insights out of that data before we can uh, train up a model. So how do we prepare and clean that data suitable for modeling? And this is where I'm going to talk very briefly about some data engineering with DBT. So Home Assistant is capturing all this data. And I'm actually capturing an awful lot of data. These sensors are receiving around 18,000 uh, updates uh, a day. And some of these sensors, I'm getting hundreds of thousands of updates uh, throughout the day. That's an awful lot of data that I'm going to have to churn through. And it's very, very chatty. It's very, very time sequenced. So my goal is to take this very, very chatty information and summarize it up. So I've got essentially an hour, uh, within an hour, the most likely temperature, the most likely humidity, and the most likely location. So I want to take some very, very noisy data and condense it down so I can actually train a model on something a bit more manageable. So I used an open source software called DBT. And DBT is a really, really good framework for taking essentially some data tasks, being able to transform it using some templated SQL, and being able to generate uh, uh, essentially a managed outcome. 
taking that very, very noisy data, condensing it down, and actually being able to seed that data so it's suitable for ingesting into a model. So that's taken us through the path of data capture and data cleansing. So now let's talk about how we're actually going to train the model and actually be able to build out an inside model so we can actually predict the forward location for our cat. Simon? So, yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm using uh, the privilege of having a microphone here. I've got a question, right? If you Absolutely. just go back a yes. slide or two. Are there any, yep, that one. Are there any advantages to using a SQL database over a graph database for this sort of work? Oh, that's a, that is actually such a fantastic question. Um, so typically, we'd want to benefit some time series information. And actually, if we had an enormous amount of data, we might actually choose a time sequence database over a relational database. Um, it just so happened that I needed to uh, build on a number of characteristics. I needed to do data capture and data transformation. So I chose to use an, a relational database. And it happens that out of the box, um, Postgres is natively supported by the platform I'm using. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, co the combination of trade-offs allow you to sort of focus down on a relational database. And Postgres just happened to be one of the supported ones, both for the data capture platform and DBT as a target. But if you had like a 1,000 cats or 10,000 cats, then you may have chosen something different based on the scale, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. If we had, uh, if we needed to uh, answer some trade offs like uh, low latency or high volume or disconnected experiences, we might choose something like a Cassandra or a Cockroach DB or some other um, uh, uh, data storage mechanism to capture some of that information. Just so happens that I only have one cat. So I wanted to. Go with simplicity over complexity on this one. No, no. But great question. No, that's cool, cool. And just for people who have a burning desire to know, um, I've just Googled the collective noun for cats, and there's three or four of them. There's clouder, there's cluster, clutter, and glaring. I'll stop talking now. Fantastic. I'm going to say a cluster of cats. Anyway, um, so regardless of whether you've got one cat or a cluster of cats, you're going to have to train a model and actually build some insights on top of this. Um, so I chose to use uh, um, a logarithmic regression to, as an initial uh, model and really uh, expressing some of the features that were going to be most important in that model. So day of the week, hour of the day, temperature, humidity, and some derived features such as if humidity is over 80 or 90%, it's typically a characteristic around raining. Um, and what's really great about this sort of feedback loop is we can start experimenting with the data and work out which bits of the data, which features of the data are most significant when it comes to working out the likely probability of the cat being in a particular location. One of the great things around the scikit-learn framework is that we can actually build up a model, test the viability of that model, take historic data and test it and see the relevancy of that and the accuracy of the model. But we can also express things like, which are the major features contributing to a prediction? So here's a quick graph of some historic data going into a model. I can actually interrogate that model and find out which are the most significant features to drive a prediction. And it turns out that things like hour of the day is a very, very significant indicator for working out the likely location of the cat. Equally, outside air temperature is a really, really great uh, and significant feature for determining the location of the cat. Surprisingly, the feature of is it raining or not is a really, really low, lowly weighted uh, characteristic in, in the derived model. So it's really interesting to generate a model and then just interrogate it and see what are the characteristics driving that derivation. One other interesting thing that we can do, uh, certainly for a, a random forest, is actually build out a visual representation of the model to see what are some of the, the essentially the, the decision points within the model. And I'm just going to point out a few because I found them quite interesting that a model actually uh, determine these. Right at the top of this model is a, is a decision point. And it says one of the most significant things is hour of the day, but equally hour of the day before and after 7 a.m. 
Turns out the model will go down one decision path if it's uh, before 7 a.m. in the model in the morning, and 7 a.m. or after, it's going to take a whole different decision tree. And this makes intuitive sense because typically my household gets up at 7 a.m. So it's really interesting that the model has picked that out as a significant feature. Another really interesting feature in this model is day of the week. It turns out that Monday through Friday is a really, really important uh, feature to express in this, in this model. And again, that makes intuitive sense. Our household has a different uh, rhythm Monday through Friday, and that also influences the behavior of our cat. So it's really interesting to go through these evolution models and actually test the accuracy, test the prediction, but also test the intuition here to make sure that everything's making sense. So you might be asking yourself, that's great, but what are you going to do with all of this? And this is where the crowd participation comes in. I want to see... I wanted to share this model, and I use this great framework called Streamlit. And Streamlit is a great way of taking a hosted pickle file, wrapping it in a web app, and then it, putting it out there for use. So you can try this yourself. You can actually uh, go to this URL, move the sliders around. You can see the behavior difference on hour of the day, temperature, humidity, day of the week. And you can actually see both a prediction of where Snowy is going to be a photo of her in that location, and you can actually expand um, the little box at the bottom and see what the accuracy and, and confidence level is for each of those predictions. So this is a great way of both uh, taking a model, playing with a model, and then exposing it and having some fun with it. So in short, that was a quick uh, feel for some of the characteristics of model development, model testing, and an application in the real world. But there's a couple of things that I've learned here and a bit of a glimpse into what's happening next here. Intuitively, I think there's some things missing from this model. I know recently we've had a lot of rain in Sydney and that's going to change the behavior of our cat. I know that days where I work from home, the cat's more likely to hang out in the study. So that's a significant feature. And I also have to ask myself, are our cats actually that predictable? I think they are, but only the data will work that out. So in answer to my first question, can machine learning predict where my cat is now? I'm going to say yes, but yes, with an 86% level of confidence. And with that, I wanted to thank you for your time. Hopefully this piqued your interest. And if you actually wanted to play with any of this code, take it and uh, hopefully model your, model your own cats and dogs behavior. You can clone this repo and have a play with yourself. Thanks very much. That is absolutely super, super cool. I love that. Yep. I do love it. I'm just gonna run a just, I'm just gonna run a short poll for the audience while I flap my gums a bit. Oh, oh please do. Which is are you a dog or a cat person? I think this is a really important question for all the important questions we're going to have tonight. Working out the trade-offs between dogs and cats in the audience is going to be super significant. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So one of the really interesting things that I like about that talk, Simon, is the, the way, and you had a picture on it, right, which is the, the way that machine learning effectively uses graph theory to figure out which tree to follow. It was that decision tree, right? I love that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and just to add a bit of clarity to this, um, this is for a level of classification modeling or prediction modeling. Um, if you're doing something like uh, NLP yeah, yeah. or vision recognition, some of these techniques aren't going to work. Yeah. So. Interestingly, I used to work for a company, I think. I'll show everyone the results. There you go. So 38% of the audience are dog people. There you go. But 46% like cats and dogs. So what? What? <laughs> I'm just saying. I think 
I think only one I, of them is it's, it's good to, you know we've got a level of neutrality in the audience. <laughs> uh, and then there's 15% that don't like either. I like it. It's good. So there's a bunch of questions in the uh, questions section. Um, so the first one is, you know, what's the rough cost for hardware? And that's from Jay. Okay. That's such a good question, Jay. Um, and I feel that there almost needs to be a warning on anything to do with home automation. Um, it's remarkably cheap to get started. Um, so the first Raspberry Pi I purchased was $40. The first temperature sensor was $10. The first ESP32 was $6. There's no upper limit on this. So I would say it's a, uh, the barriers to getting started are quite low. The initial outlay is quite low, but I would like to put a bit of a warning here. This thing, these things can get out of hand pretty quickly. And I speak, ask me how I know. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Simon, Simon is now living in a tent, as you can see behind him. <laughs> <laughs> It's a side effect. You've got to make trade-offs. Yeah. yeah, it's it's the partner that looks at you and says, what's this $1,000 Alibaba expense? It's like, don't worry. <laughs> uh, there's another question from Jun Chen. So it says, hi, Simon, I have a question about the data collection. Can you tell us your sample size? How many days does your sample cover? You know, it looks like the project is built on panel data. That you have you considered if season has an influence on the result? Firstly, I'd like to say hi, June. Um, that is a brilliant, brilliant question. Um, I didn't cover it, but the um, I captured four months worth of data before I attempted uh, to train the model, um, and that came up to. I'm going. I can't remember the exact number, but I think I had around 400 million records of raw data. Uh, to seed this model to begin with. So it was a non-trivial non amount of data. Um, but it, there's a really good side question here of during that four months, obviously we went through a season change and I didn't really reflect that in the model. So we went from a uh, very, very uh, cold and damp winter to a nice spring and that kind of influenced or possibly influenced the uh, the model. So. My, one of one of my goals is to keep capturing data and keep re, retraining the model so it can take things like seasonality into account. That's definitely a very good question. In short, the more data, the better, and the more features that could potentially get get weighted or judged as inputs to the model. Hopefully, the more accurate we can we can make it over time. So there's a, another question from Jordan as well, which is: Have you considered building the model from the perspective of temporal data? Uh, yes, and, yes. Hang on, fact, hang on, there was... hang on. Before you answer, for those of us that don't do this for a living day in, day out, can you explain what temporal data is and the difference? Oh, I'm just going to summarise this as time series data. Um, so in a way, this was time series data, uh, which I then whittled down so it wasn't really time series data. So if you can imagine that everything here had initially an epoch uh, date time down to the millisecond, and that went nicely into a, an ordered uh, immutable list of um, sensor events. I then kind of stripped a lot of that out and just pulled out dumb, dumb uh, features such as hour, such as day of the week, and I threw all of the other data away. Um, so I'm going to give you an inelegant answer of I took temporal data and then stripped it down just to uh, make my life a little bit easier. But uh, it'd be worth, re uh, to your previous question around seasonality, I think that's uh, some really important data that could actually build, uh, uh, increase the level of accuracy. And the last question before we pass over to Faisal is, um, where did you run the processing to train the model? Uh, yeah, in in short, uh, the local the the data capture all happened locally. It just happened to be running on a little Raspberry Pi. Um, the training I initially uh, did some work in uh, the Google Colab environment, 
And then I realized it was actually a bit, uh, it's a great way to start. Uh, if you're familiar with things like SageMaker, again, or Databricks, Google Colab is a really, uh, is an analogous notebook environment. Um, I then actually over time uh, put it back into the Raspberry Pi so I could retrain the model uh, automatically overnight. So um, I'm going to say there were many answers to it. In the end, I ended up doing most things uh, just on a Raspberry Pi 4. Okay, no, that's good. That's good. Okay, so.